for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. And the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible to screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know the work. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. Uh, Paul, it's I, I don't know how to do the show without an interruption at, uh, up front there. <laughs> well, it looks like you interrupted yourself, so that's great. <laughs> I did interrupt myself. Uh, with us tonight is the great Dr. Molly Hoyblind. Molly, thank you for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me back. I'm excited to have our guest here today. Yeah, we're excited to have you back. I know you're working on multiple episodes, but did you want to give the audience a little teaser about what we talk about tonight on the show? Yeah, so we cover a lot of ground about nutrition with Dr. Steve DeVries, and um, we talk a lot about how to incorporate healthy food patterns in our patients' diets and some kind of nitty-gritty specifics about how to make small changes that can really have an impact in patients' cardiovascular risks. And I wanted to shout out to his nonprofit, which we talk about at the end of the show, which is the GaplesInstitute.org. He has a provider's course on there and has a free course for the public with basically just very practical nutrition tips. I've gone through the course myself online as part of prep for this episode, and I found it very useful, very practical information. So the audience should check that out. Dr. Stephen DeVries is a preventive cardiologist and executive director of the Gaples Institute, which is an educational nonprofit with the mission of advancing the role of nutrition and lifestyle in healthcare. He is also an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. DeVries wrote, What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Cholesterol, and co-edited the book, Integrative Cardiology. He has been voted by his peers many years over as one of the best doctors in America. Dr. DeVries and his work in integrative cardiology have been featured on National Public Radio and PBS. He is an absolute joy to talk to, as you are about to find out. So without further delay, here's our discussion with Dr. Stephen DeVries. So this is the part of the show where uh, Paul and Molly and I are going to ask you a bunch of questions. The first one we always ask traditionally is, can you give the audience a one-liner about yourself just to give them kind of a flavor of who you are, both as a doctor and outside of the hospital or practice setting? Sure. Yeah, I describe myself as very positive, uh, tenacious, Midwesterner, a nature lover, father of two boys, and an unconventional cardiologist. It's a good description. And we're going to get into a lot of what makes you an unconventional cardiologist. But uh, first, Molly, uh, any questions, any burning questions? Yeah. What's something in the last week or two that really brought you joy, either at home or at work or in your personal life? Uh, That's an easy one. We were just in the Rocky Mountains and looking at the mountains and being in in nature like that was just incredibly joyful. It's it's a really, it's kind of awesome in the original sense of the word. And uh, it was just spectacular. So that brought me a lot of joy. That's great. So great to get away from the computer screen. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. I wasn't completely away, but on the hike I was. So that was great. (laughs) Paul, do you have a question? I do. I I think the question has become increasingly popular, I think is the one I'm going to ask, especially since Stuart is not here. But can you tell me what, can you think of a favorite failure and, and let us know what you actually learned from it? Mm. Well, is it too early to call my performance on this uh, uh, interview (laughs) one of those? (laughs) No, no. (laughs) As long as it's your favorite, I'm on board. (laughs) I'm not sure. You know, honestly, uh, not not that things uh, don't don't go as planned, because they certainly don't often. But, you know, I don't really frame things that don't go right seriously as as failures, but more like things that didn't work out or success that hasn't happened yet. But I I really don't, I don't really view things um, in that way. It's strange. I I know it sounds Pollyannish to say, but it's true. 
Yeah, no, I love the contextualizing as a success that hasn't happened yet. That seems much healthier than the way I frame um, <laughs> some of my learning experiences. So, that's great. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, in outer space, but it, but it's it's really true. You know, it didn't go the way you planned, uh, the way I hoped. I mean, certainly disappointment uh, that 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 comes up, but I don't really frame it as failure often. Can you recommend a book to the audience? Just any book that you've recently enjoyed. Um, well, one that I, I think a lot about, certainly uh, as a physician, is one I read um, many years ago, Kitchen Table Wisdom by Rachel Naomi Remen. And it was just stories of patients and encounters. And remember, you know, hearing about uh, kind of the background story that people had and how they patients got in the condition that they were at and what their experiences were. It really, like years ago kind of gave me an impression that stuck with me to this day. So um, I haven't read it in a long time, but I would say in terms of impressionable books that made an impact uh, professionally, I would say that would be one. That is a new one to me. Yeah. Kitchen Table Wisdom. You should check it out. It's a a book of stories and one that uh, you won't soon forget. Paul or Molly, any other questions before we move on? Yeah, I guess I'm just curious. So you started out training as a conventional cardiologist, as you describe it. How long, <laughs> right. how long did you practice in that vein? And, and what sort of brought you over to more of a uh, integrative cardiology? Yeah, well, it was kind of a gradual thing. Um, you're right, I, I started out, you know, trained in the conventional way. I was at WashU. And um, really, I I became a director of an outpatient clinic uh, early on after uh, my training was over. And what I saw was was something that kind of took me aback, that, you know, we would see people for various cardiac issues. Um, Often they they came to clinic right after they were discharged, and we did a good job initially. But then I would often, you know, we track people and see that very often they'd be coming back to the hospital again, and then back to the outpatient clinic again, recovering from their hospital stay. And it seemed almost futile in a way that we were we were definitely doing a great job, you know, fixing the acute problem, patching them up. But then they'd come back, you know, it was kind of a revolving door. And something struck me early on that that it wasn't right, that we really were, were just uh, doing stopgap treatment, but not really helping in the long run. So that kind of got me on the path to thinking about prevention. And initially, of course, in the cardiology vein, uh, statins were relatively uh, new in their arrival, so that was kind of the big thing. People thought if you put statins in the drinking water, you know, we would eliminate <laughs> coronary disease. And so we kind of um, we kind of tried to do that in a way, and we did start a, a lipid clinic, and and I think that did make a big impact. But lo and behold, guess what? It wasn't a cure. People still kept coming back. So I began to think, you know, more broadly about what we could be doing differently. And at that same time, I started to um, write a column for the Chicago Sun Times called Heartbeat, and it was kind of like a dear Abby for the cardiologist. You know, ask the cardiologist a question. And a lot of people were writing in questions about nutrition, and I had no idea how to answer them. So I I had to look every one of them up. And as I looked them up, I I began to see that, wow, there's a lot of literature about nutrition, and somehow it was completely absent in my training in internal medicine and in cardiology. So it kind of got me into the vein of looking at a bigger picture than I initially had. And um, and then, you know, I began to see patients that were doing all kinds of different things with stress management and so forth. So that kind of opened my, my mind up a little bit further. So I, I began to shift toward, you know, a prevention focus that was exclusively focused on lipids to a much broader view that came to focus much more on nutrition and lifestyle. So that's my journey from conventional to Somewhat unconventional. I, I was kind of unconventional to begin with, even because a lot of cardiologists go into cardiology to do procedures and and to cath, and and that never was was my thing. I, I really was fascinated more with the function of the heart and of things that were not really uh, related to procedures. So that initially was my my distinction, but the prevention focus and then the nutrition focus became um, even even less conventional as I went along. 
We talked about this a little bit off air, and and you mentioned this early on that I know with my training, I feel like nutrition was sort of lumped in with biochemistry. It was sort of this afterthought after you learned <laughs> exactly. the gym cycle for the 14th time. So it's I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind, and this is a huge broad question, which probably could be the entire episode, but sort of what your thoughts are on the state of nutrition education and undergraduate medical education now and sort of where you see it going. Well, sadly, it's pretty non-existent in uh, undergraduate medical education. Um, by non-existent, uh, the, the data is a 19 hours average of nutrition in all four years of medical school. And just as you pointed out, a lot of that is biochemistry. And a lot of it are vitamin deficiency states, which, you know, in the early 1900s and mid 1900s, these were just kind of coming to light. And so, uh, unfortunately, they remained uh, to a large extent the focus of what nutrition is taught in medical school. Uh, although there are clearly exceptions, um, most medical schools, they, there's very little uh, clinically relevant nutrition being taught. So um, unfortunately, uh, it, it's kind of a sad state in medical school. But what's even worse is that things deteriorate further in graduate medical education. Um, most uh, residency programs, uh, from what I hear from the feedback, uh, there's very little nutrition taught. In fact, the ACGME guidelines for uh, requirements for residency training in internal medicine, the word nutrition doesn't appear, nor food or diet or anything like that. Yeah. In cardiology, it's, it's uh, a very lengthy document. The word nutrition doesn't appear. Same thing in pediatrics. It's, it's unbelievable. Holy that cow. is amazing. You know, you get kind of, you, you reap what you sow, and if there's no requirement, sadly, it, it doesn't take place. So uh, we're actually working on, with the nonprofit that I can tell you about later, we're working to um, advocate for changes to the ACGME and for board exams and so forth. So we're trying to change the status quo, but it's, it's kind of a tough place to be. And unfortunately, in all the years I've been in practice, um, nearly 30 years, we had I had zero nutrition education in my training, and sadly, uh, the state of affairs is is pretty close to that right now. Steve, I wanted to ask, kind of as a starting point, how is the data for using a diet in in place of medications to treat patients, or or maybe just in addition to medications? Are there lots of good studies to point to a mortality benefit or a cardiovascular risk reduction? Yeah, there are, and you know, I I, uh, I appreciate uh, the 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 way you posed the question and 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 how you revised it because I, I do feel that definitely that uh, with with uh, you know more attention to diet uh, certainly for primary prevention we can um, you know they talk about looking at the the ten year risk for cardiovascular event and uh, you know if we exceed a threshold to consider statins you know my argument to that is why don't we work on the risk factors that are modifiable and try and get us under that threshold so that we don't have to think so much about a statin for primary prevention. So uh, I would say that, but for the most part, it's not either or. Uh, and I wouldn't say that the main um, reason to focus on nutrition would be to um, to not not need medicine, although that's certainly a great goal. But I would say that they, they absolutely complement each other uh, in a very powerful way. So yeah, in terms of the data for cardiovascular risk reduction, uh, it's robust. Um, the Lyon uh, Diet Heart Study uh, compared a control group to a group that uh, was advised to be on a Mediterranean diet. And it's a great study because they actually the uh, participants weren't told uh, exact amounts of what to eat in the Mediterranean diet arm. They were just told to eat more vegetables and fruit, more whole grains in place of refined uh, less red meat and more fish, nuts, and, and to use as the cooking oil, olive oil, and a canola-based margarine. And in five years, there was a 72% risk reduction for cardiovascular events. So it was huge. That was secondary prevention. And then the, the PREDIMED study, which was just recently revised and republished, but even in that re republished mode, uh, it was huge. It was um, uh, almost a 30% uh, event reduction in the Mediterranean diet group uh, compared to the controls for those who were, um, you know, again, on the Mediterranean diet. That's primary prevention. So there, there's data there. Um, there's also data uh, looking at uh, what is responsible for cardiometabolic deaths and the factors responsible. An article published in JAMA just last year 
showed that uh, suboptimal diet is responsible for 45% of cardiometabolic deaths, and that's deaths due to coronary disease, stroke, and diabetes. So there's there's a lot of data showing the the benefits of uh, of nutrition, and and the data is very strong. Excellent. Those are pretty dramatic. Yeah. How do you actually translate that when you're talking to patients? Like, what do you describe to them as a Mediterranean diet or as a heart healthy diet? Yeah. So, kind of just um, as a little bit um, more uh, expounding on on what I just mentioned, but it actually is is pretty simple to describe. Uh, like anything else, it's simple to describe, but depending on where people start out, it might be a little bit more challenging to uh, to to actually uh, take on. But basically, it, it's to stock your diet with as many vegetables and fruit as you can, to um, again avoiding refined grains as much as possible, and then you know we we drill down a little bit as to what that means, what's a refined grain, what what constitutes a whole grain. Um, and then talking about, again, at least cutting down on, on red meat uh, and replacing it with fish or other uh, non-animal proteins. Talk about that. And talk about healthy fats, uh, olive oil, uh, and, and there's a variety of other ones, but olive oil is probably the ideal uh, cooking oil. To talk a little bit about that. And and then to talk about snack foods, you know, what do you what do you snack on, and uh, and are you eating breakfast and so forth. So some of the some of the uh, ways to put meals together in addition to what each meal consists of. So basically, uh, the Mediterranean diet is is really a, a formulation of that. And again, you know, with any label like Mediterranean diet or even a vegetarian diet, it doesn't really mean one thing. Um, a vegetarian diet, for instance, can mean a whole variety of things, uh, as can a Mediterranean diet. So, you know, rather than mention a label, I really like to break down the components so it makes it a little bit more identifiable. And um, one thing I think that's really important in talking to patients, and I think this has been one of the huge barriers for getting uh, nutritional interventions uh, to come across effectively to patients, is that, you know, to talk about percentage of fats being one way, you know, one fat or another, or grams of fat, or, or even grams of sodium, or milligrams of sodium, those sorts of descriptions aren't particularly helpful. I mean, they might be great for a public policy point of view, for, for a big picture look. But when you're speaking to patients, I like to, to do visuals. So um, uh, in the Mediterranean diet, for instance, they weren't, the Lyon study I mentioned, uh, participants weren't advised how many vegetables and fruit to eat, but they did do a diet a diary at the end of the study. So the investigators did have an idea as to what uh, what they were consuming. And, and on average, it, it was about five servings of vegetables. And if I tell a patient, eat five servings of vegetables, you know, what does that mean? You don't have anything in your kitchen with a marker that says serving, really. And it doesn't really make much sense. Or even, even cupfuls, they do have, but most people aren't accustomed to measuring things in cups. So what I do, what I've done is to um, kind of put on a plate what what that would look like, and I've taken pictures of that, color pictures, to say, like, this is the quantity of vegetables that I am I'm, I'm thinking about. And you may like different vegetables, and, you know, that's fine. But to give people a visual of what it would look like on a plate, I think is really important. Because, you know, all the science in the world is, is great, but if you can't effectively communicate that to people in a language they really can relate to, I think it really falls on deaf ears. And I think that's one of the problems in nutrition, um, clinical nutrition, uh, in terms of uh, making it real for patients is that you haven't really done a good job in translating the science into something that's really um, digestible, if you would. <laughs> I, I wanted to just ask a little bit more specific about the Mediterranean diet. Is there is there something that it does not include? Because I, I always found it like, okay, you, you drink one or two glasses of red wine a night and I'm on a Mediterranean diet. But can you talk a little bit specifically about like how, how what would it sound like if I was a patient, you were telling me what to eat for a Mediterranean diet and then maybe we can do the same for one of the other diets that are out there. But let's start with that. Sure. So you're asking, like, what would it not include? Like, it, it Yeah. So let's say, let's just pretend I'm one of your patients and you're going to just tell me, I want you to start, try a Mediterranean diet and this is what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat. 
Well, you know, I actually wouldn't pose it that way. I would okay. say that these are some of the categories of foods that uh, are would be really helpful to uh, to incorporate in your diet, and and you know, and usually one of the things actually to just to take a step back when you you talk about eating uh, more of one category, you know, unless people are cutting the calories in their diet, which is for many people a good idea, but unless the discussion is termed um, is framed in terms of you know wanting to cut the calories, if you tell people to eat less of one thing, they're they're typically going to eat more of something else. <laughs> so it's really good if you're talking about something specific, you know, and that actually, it, it's a huge issue. Because uh, as I'm sure you can recall back, you know, 10, 20 years ago, the idea was to cut down on fat, you know, maybe total fat in some people's view. And, and, and certainly, it still is the idea to cut back on saturated fat. But if you just say that, if you just say, you know, I want you to, you, you know, consume fewer foods with saturated fat, well, again, unless you're cutting down in calories, the three macronutrients are fat, protein, and carbs. It's it's kind of hard to eat more carbs. It's it's something that people aren't want to do naturally. So if you cut down on fat, you're generally going to eat more carbs and typically not the most healthy kinds of carbs. So again, um, whenever like you know to to cut down on refined grains is part of the Mediterranean diet. But there should be a counter to that to say, well, you know, we'd like you to replace them with whole grains and even explain what, what that means. Whole grain bread, even 100% whole grain bread, isn't the best type of whole grain. The best kind of whole grains would be boiled intact whole grains. The reason is that when you pound the whole grain into flour, you increase the surface area and the glycemic index increases and, and the sugar uh, release increases from the same whole grain. So basically, uh, getting back to your original question, what's not in a Mediterranean diet? I would say processed meats are not in a Mediterranean diet and it shouldn't be, shouldn't be in any diet. And we can talk more about Not that my later. sweet bacon. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, let me, you know, we could, we could uh, divert into that, uh, go into that corridor for a second. And I would say that, you know, now that trans fats, thankfully, are out of the food supply, I would say that processed meats have taken their place as being kind of the only food that is pretty much universally agreed to be something that the right amount is zero. And the reason I say that is the World Health Organization just a few years ago deemed uh, processed meats to be uh, carcinogens to humans. So that actually should be reason enough. But, but actually, there's more reasons yet. Uh, processed meats are very strongly uh, related to risk of coronary disease and diabetes, and actually much more so than unprocessed red meat. So the um, the processed meat, and, and why that is, is not entirely clear, but there's more sodium in processed meat than in, in unprocessed meat, and also nitrites that are uh, thought to be carcinogenic when they're taken in the context of meat. So um, I would say processed meats are something that that are not part of the Mediterranean diet, shouldn't be part of any diet. And I would say that a diet low in saturated fat, I would say that foods rich in saturated fat are certainly don't have a prominent place in the Mediterranean diet, not that the uh, amount is typically zero, it's, it's usually more than zero, but but I would say that uh, foods rich in saturated fat, uh, mostly animal from animal products, um, would be in, in lower quantities in the Mediterranean diet. But I would say apart from from that, um, there really aren't many, many foods, other, you know, whole foods that aren't part. But what's not part are processed foods. And, you know, that's a really broad and kind of a uh, means everything definition. But but foods that are, are very uh, removed from their original plant source state. Um, are, are processed and by far removed. The more things that are added to them, and often salt, sugar, and fat, as well as a variety of chemicals, I would say they don't play uh, a role in the Mediterranean diet or should play a role in any diet. Uh, but I, I would say apart from processed foods, um, highly processed foods, uh, processed meat, and um, um, yeah, I would I would say that just about everything else. I guess Paul and I moderate. need to cancel our pancake and bacon and scrapple <laughs> breakfast we had planned. 
<laughs> this is a deep part of my Pennsylvania Dutch yeah. heritage. I can't give it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, listen, I, I, I got you. I'm uh, often talking about uh, glycemic loads of things like bagels, and I know that's my uh, my heritage gone uh, gone awry. <laughs> but uh, that's that's a problem. So, I'm I'm with you. I feel your pain. Um. Okay, Paul, you were about to ask a question, and I I interrupted you there. No, that's okay. I was I wanted to ask, <laughs> just reading through the the 2018 New England Journal paper, that I, one of the prescriptive elements of the Mediterranean diet that surprised me was encouraging to eat at least four tablespoons of olive oil a day, like to the extent that they were supplying like just gallons of olive oil to the study. Like, I just wonder, do you, in terms of counseling your patients, do you, is that something that you address specifically? Uh, well, I don't encourage them to guzzle olive oil. It's not <laughs> shots of olive oil. That's for sure. Wrong. But uh, you know, in in the Predmit study, they gave each family a uh, uh, a kind of a week supply. So uh, that was uh, the, the amount that was supplied was not for necessarily for individual use. But yeah, uh, olive oil was was fairly heavily consumed in the diet. And interestingly enough. Um, uh, there was not weight gain in the uh, in the Predimed, uh study in the group that uh, was assigned to olive oil, uh, even though each tablespoon 125 calories. It's a lot of additional calories, but um, whether or not you know they replaced other calories because the oil was satiating or some other mechanism in play. But uh, no, no, I, I, olive oil is. Uh, I, I would say that it, it its best use is is uh, very. Um, conservatively, you know, it, it should not be poured on and thought of as a as a tonic, but in terms of uh, you know small amounts used in cooking is is a great idea or for salad dressing things like that. But no, I I don't uh, suggest it be guzzled. Okay, <laughs> so more <laughs> more is the oil of choice than something to be drinking on the side. And I w- I was surprised in the lion heart study that I'm not sure how you say. L- Lion, but um, that they used a canola based margarine. I mean, I, that's not something that I think of as particularly healthy. But do you feel like that's similar to olive oil? Um, well, it's, it's interesting. Canola oil gets a lot of uh, a lot of pushback, and for for some reasons that I, I think are, are valid and others that aren't. Um, yeah, so they used a canola based margarine, and, and it's high in uh, ALA, uh, an, a plant source of omega three. So that was, I think, the the reason why. And one of the pushbacks for canola oil is that it uh, is often uh, genetically modified. But you might know in in Europe, especially at the time, uh, they they didn't allow, or I'm not even sure at the time of the study, they they had genetically modified uh, canola oil available. But they, in any case, they they don't allow it uh, as as uh, in more recent years. So um, in the study, at least, it wasn't a genetically modified version. So that's often the pushback for canola. I, I know uh, if you go on the web, you can see all kinds of citations that canola oil is the most highly processed oil there is. And some people say should never be consumed because it's so highly processed. It, it's not any more, it's not by necessity any more processed than any other kind of oil. So I don't think that, um, that criticism is, is really well, well placed. But uh, again, I think the reason it was used was because of the uh, ALA, the, the plant source of a Omega three, and whether canola oil is as good as olive oil or not as good, I, I don't think. Uh, I don't think we know. What we do know that um, for olive oil, in addition to the fact it's got uh, a high monosaturated fat uh, content, which um, which is one attribute, but they're also in in the ex, in the best form of it, the the real extra virgin olive oil. There's a very high polyphenol content, and and the polyphenol content is thought to be um, also very important. As a matter of fact, if you get lesser qualities of olive oil, um, uh, the the virgin or, or other lesser grades, uh, actually it's been shown that uh, you, you get a decrease in what sometimes is a small rise in HDL with olive oil, but you get a, a decreased HDL response, a decrease in the usual boost uh, of HDL when you use the lower grades of uh, of olive oil that uh, don't have the polyphenols. So again, the, the oils are more than the sum of their fats. And, and so um, uh, olive oil might have an edge that way. But in any case, that's, that's the canola story. I wanted to talk a li- take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the type of fats. You mentioned already trans fats have kind of been outlawed, and that's good riddance to them. 
saturated fats should be limited. And and you just talked a little bit about monounsaturated fats. Can you give examples of like which monounsaturated fats and then which polyunsaturated fats have a benefit that we should be telling patients to eat? Um, yeah, I w- would say again, the, the monounsaturated fats, uh, olive oil uh, is big in that, uh, avocados, also another very healthy source of fats. Uh, for um, uh, then for the polyunsaturated uh, fats, uh, they're the omega threes and sixes. So for the threes, there are uh, two types of uh, omega threes: the marine based sources, and those are EPA and DHA. So they come from fish. Uh, so that would be the source. And then the plant sources are uh, chia, uh, flax, flaxseed oil, um, walnuts. Uh, those are our sources of the uh, plant of, of the plant omega threes, and then omega sixes are, are really all the other vegetable oils uh, are uh, are filled with omega sixes. And the o- omega sixes, al- although there is some um, thought that they are pro-inflammatory, and, and you can read um, a lot of conjecture about that, uh, but but that that is very much uh, a controversial area that's not not completely settled. Uh, what is true is that the vegetable oils, the Omega sixes are our favorite oils to be used in many processed foods. So they they often don't keep good company in that way. They're they're often in in the processed foods that are uh, not high quality. So by way of the company they keep, not not great. But but say omega sixes, the soybean oil that's often in uh, salad dressings. Uh, you know when it's in that context, uh, probably not not a harm and and may actually have a, a small beneficial effect. Paul, I think this might be a good time. I mean, uh, we Paul had had a question in pre-recording about food deserts, and this was also a question we got on social media because a lot of the foods you you mentioned, avocados, extra virgin olive oil, fish, uh, not exactly affordable foods. It, do you have a workaround for this? Uh, you're practicing in Chicago, so presumably you may see uh, some patients uh, that are less privileged to be able to afford these things. Yeah, absolutely, and and there's no doubt that uh, uh, finances, you know, play a, a huge role in affordability and and even access uh, issues in in areas. So yeah, there are. So there, there's unfortunately, it's a it's a huge social problem that's not easily solved. But in terms of you know what what can be done on the micro level in terms of individual advice, um, a few things. One is that. Um, Water consumption is cheaper than soda. So the first thing that is actually budget positive is to encourage people, if they are drinking soda, to substitute it with water. Uh, so that's that's a, an easy one. Uh, beyond that, uh, healthy, healthy foods that are a little bit more affordable are canned beans would be one thing. Uh, canned fish, uh, the right kind of canned fish, but, but canned fish would be one. And then... Um, Many uh, fruits and vegetables that are frozen, uh, if they're available, uh, they don't need to be fresh. Uh, the good news is that uh, freezing vegetables and fruit really retains uh, much of the, the vast majority of their nutritional content. So that's also a more affordable way to, to get vegetables and fruit. Um, but, but then there are, there are other issues, not only even affording them, but, but then... Um, you know, actually using them in everyday cooking and, and whether that's part of the uh, repertoire of, of cooking to use uh, beans in place of some other things. So, um, you know, there are, many, there are many barriers in addition to access and affordability. There's also, you know, making the foods real on the plate. Like, what do you do with these foods even if you <laughs> could afford them? You know, are you used to cooking with beans? Are you used to cooking with frozen vegetables or vegetables at all? So, you know, there, there's several levels of issues that, that stack up. But when it comes to the affordability issue, you know the things I mentioned are are ones that might uh, mitigate the, the 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 barriers a bit. What kind of snacking recommendations do you make? I know one of the issues that we see certain in the neighborhood I practice is just a, an abundance of bodegas and corner stores where it's just easy to sort of stop on your way to school even and, and just pick up something that's incredibly calorically dense and without any <laughs> real nutritive value otherwise. Like, do you have anything sort of portable that you suggest to your patients? Absolutely. This is a great, Paul, this is great and 
all of you, I, I would highly recommend um, nuts. Uh, nut, I've got, um, I usually take uh, some nuts and put them in a little glad bag and I, I keep them in my glove compartment. I, I often have them in my pocket, uh, in my uh, my computer case. It's just a, it's it's like the ideal snack food because not only is it incredibly healthy, they're satiating and they kind of last a long time. Unfortunately, I was one of those kids in uh, junior high that had like my sandwich like in the locker like you know all <laughs> semester and then kind of <laughs> plucked it out and like oh my gosh like what have I created what mold have I created <laughs> uh, maybe a new antibiotic but um, so the nuts are great you know that they they don't spoil uh, in in the short term so. Um, uh, so yeah, nuts are a great snack, and then beyond that, uh, fruit. Fruit is a good snack, and you know, s- small pieces of dark chocolate are a, a good snack as well. But uh, I would say that the nuts are an especially good one. And you know, what what is the biggest problem? Like you said, the the, the carbs that are so um, enticing. Um, you know, most people are very attracted to uh, sugary uh, kind of carb laden snacks. Um, but you know the the thing that happens, uh, which which you're uh, very familiar with, I'm sure, just from uh, seeing patients talk about it and maybe your own experience. You know, you have the donut and it's very satiating, and your blood sugar rises, and then it rises quickly and it drops quickly, and you know, an hour and a half later, you need another hit, another donut back in the uh, doctor's lounge or whatever, and uh, that cycle continues. <laughs> but if you do something like uh, nuts, it it actually is much more satiating. And, and really, really healthy. Uh, and some people complain that there's, you know, a lot of calories. A handful of almonds, say, has about 200 calories on, on the label. But uh, actually, it's interesting. There are studies uh, showing that when people uh, have take nuts and, and they're used in place of other kind of carb-laden snacks, that people typically not only do they not uh, gain weight, but actually nuts are associated with weight loss which is really interesting. There was a New England Journal paper that uh, looked at foods associated with weight gain and with weight loss. And the foods associated with weight gain were no big surprise, like potato chips and fries and sodas. And the ones associated with weight loss, the two biggest foods associated with weight loss were nuts and yogurt. So go figure. That's interesting. Yeah, so I guess, you know, and, and you were sort of talking about how uh, even caloric dense foods like nuts don't necessarily seem to increase weight gain, um, you know, which which kind of goes towards, I think, some more of the kind of popular thinking in, in nutrition literature that a calorie isn't necessarily a calorie, you know, that we need to think about the quality of calories. Um, and you had said before, you don't necessarily encourage patients to you know, count specific calories or count specific foods and more just focus on an overall healthy pattern. In patients who are trying to lose weight, do you talk more about that with them or do you have them be more careful about counting calories? Yeah, no, I I think you're absolutely right. The pattern, dietary pattern is certainly the most important. But I do think that, you know, at least to a limited degree, uh, calorie counting can be uh, helpful in the very early stages of people who are trying to lose weight, to even just to get a baseline sense as to what it is that they're eating, kind of to take stock of what their usual eating pattern is and and the calorie distribution in general that's associated with it. Uh, you know, I think you know if you go to uh, your favorite coffee shop and pick up you know one of the uh, one of the bakery items, I think most people would be shocked, you know, or have been shocked to see the calorie count associated with it. And I think you know, in, in at least. Um, kind of as a baseline assessment, I think it's helpful for people to kind of take stock and see, you know, what the calorie distribution is of what they're eating, you know, it, it, to begin with. So I think that's one useful data point, but but I certainly don't think it's an important one to be, you know, very blindly focused on. I think it's, it's the quality of the diet. I think people can't actually, for the most part, count calories um, on, in a consistent way for the long run. I think it's just too tedious. And although some people will do it, um, my experience is that the vast majority will not. And so I think, you know, because it's not completely necessary uh, is one reason. And the second is that it's hard to do. I think the idea of looking at healthful foods is especially important. It's really hard to 
you know, OD on, on dark green leafy vegetables. Uh, fruit, I guess it's, it is possible maybe to eat uh, more than is optimal, but, but it's really hard if you're eating, you know, uh, foods that are, um, you know, unprocessed whole grain foods, you're eating, um, uh, vegetables and fruit. Uh, if, if those are a big part of your diet and beans, it's really, really hard to, um, to overeat in a major way, you know, uh, excess calories. So I do think, um, small look, at least a, an initial glimpse at calories to start with, but then more of focus on pattern is the way to go. Are you encouraging your patients to use any apps at all to sort of track just macronutrient distribution or just kind of general calorie counts? You know, there's a variety of apps, uh, not any one in particular, but yeah, I think that can be one useful way uh, to uh, uh, you know lose it as one that is 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 popular. But uh, there are many apps that are, are available, and I think my experience is that people, you know, generally are uh, if they're kind of into uh, the idea of that, they will stick to that for a short time, which again I think is useful just to get a baseline assessment. But I do think it's um, it's a tall order to expect that people will continue with the calorie counting for an extended period of time. And, and as I mentioned, I, I don't think it's uh, essential for people to do that. I wanted to start to move into some of the like kind of rapid fire questions, maybe from Twitter and uh, Facebook and Instagram, because we had gotten a lot of them. But is there anything else before we get into that part that you think any big, big questions we're missing here? No, you know, one of the I think most important things to uh, maybe take away from this podcast is just, um, you know, people are, uh, uh, clinicians are, are really busy. And I know the idea of adding, you know, one more topic, if they're not already focused on nutrition, what, the idea of adding one more topic seems, you know, onerous and maybe undoable. But I would say, you know, a couple of things that, you know, if you know, if we can instill, you know, the idea in the patient's mind that nutrition is really important, uh, even in a very quick and and basic way, I think it would make a huge difference uh, to to go beyond the status quo. And the way you can do that quickly, a couple things. One is, you know, to identify one item that you think the patient uh, could, uh, you know, which you mutually agree uh, is something that could be worked on. And pick just one item, even if you think there might be 10 nutritional issues that exist, but, you know, because you're so limited in time, if you just pick one, if they're going out to eat fast food, you know, every day, you know, twice a day, and they're, they're uh, you know, eating, uh, you know, hot dogs every day, you know, if the thing the patient is willing to do is to talk to you about, you know, avoiding sodas, which they're drinking three sodas a day. You know, if you just do that, even forgetting about the other problems, focusing on one, maybe of many items, every clinic visit, that'd be huge. And if you don't have time for that, I would say that the most important thing, which takes no more than a minute to do, is just to make sure you convey to the patient that, listen, you know, if you need this medication, you know, the medication that I'm prescribing is really essential and it's very important that you take it. But don't for a minute think that if you just take the medication alone, that that is going to position you for optimal health because it won't. The medicine is great, but it's going to require you know, work related to nutrition and lifestyle in order to get the full health benefits that I would like to see for you to have. I think that message, it just takes a minute to convey, but really important. Because the thing that I, I keep emphasizing that if a patient comes to see you and you talk about, you know, whether, you know, they're on their ACE inhibitor and whether they're taking their statin and are there side effects from the meds and all that. But if you do that whole conversation, you refill their meds, and you don't talk about nutrition, the patient is going to walk away thinking, you know, I guess it doesn't matter. I guess it doesn't matter that uh, I'm overweight. I guess it doesn't matter what I eat because the doctor never mentioned anything about it. So I guess all I need to do is to take my meds. So I think if you take anything away from the podcast, that would be one really important point to make is just to try your very best to make sure to impress on the patient that nutrition is a priority. Awesome. Do you frame the discussion any differently when you're discussing sort of diet for weight loss as opposed to diet for prevention of disease or just diet for overall health? Do you change the way that you talk about it? Um, not really. I, I really uh, try by taking the pressure off the, the patient to, to focus more on um, 
a, a healthful eating pattern, uh, as we talked about, because you know that's something that um, although you know all all lifestyle changes are challenging, but that's something that they definitely could do potentially. They could you know potentially eat more vegetables and fruit. They could cut down on sodas, but when you pose the goal more as weight loss, then, you know, that might not necessarily happen, even if they make some healthy food substitutions. You know, we all know that sometimes initially, you know, weight loss happens even with caloric restriction, but then the body, you know, responds often in a, a very strange way by holding on to calories and needing to uh, have further caloric restriction uh, to, to maintain the weight loss that was easier to obtain in the early stages. So it can be really frustrating for people if you um, focus on, on the weight loss as the issue. Obviously, that's one of the goals for people who are overweight, but I, I tend to still keep the focus on a healthful eating pattern. And in most cases, the weight comes as a natural consequence. I mean, not always, but it's actually, although the, this conversation is about nutrition, Actually, the same argument holds true for physical activity. One of the things for people who are typically sedentary, you know, we try uh, if it's medically safe to get them, you know, up and moving as much as possible, uh, not terming uh, the desire to do that as exercise, but more as physical activity. Right. And, you know, I, I've often had the uh, experience, and I, I'm sure this will resonate with all of you, that... Um, People will say, okay, yeah, I started to do more. I'm much more active, but, you know, I haven't lost an ounce of weight. You know, I guess the whole exercise idea was a total waste of time. And, you know, the, the data is very clear on that, that even uh, for people who, who don't lose an ounce of weight, who remain uh, overweight or even obese, that being overweight or obese and being physically active uh, puts you in a much lower cardiovascular risk category than being that same weight, but being uh, more sedentary. So I tell people that I said, listen, you know, even though you haven't lost weight, you've enormously helped your health in ways that you, you may not be able to measure on the scale, but I can assure you exist. So please don't feel like you know exercise is only done in the service of weight loss. It's got you know a whole myriad of other benefits as well. So, it's same kind of thing holds true for people adopting a healthier pattern of diet, even if they don't you know we don't don't really focus on the weight loss issue, but more on the thing that they definitely can do, and that is definitely can at least make a move to eating more healthfully. Steve, I wanted to ask you about uh, this. Is one of the questions we got quite a few times on social media. What about macronutrient content of a diet? Is there is there one specific like low fat, high protein, low carb, high carb? What is there one that's better than the other for cardiovascular risk reduction? No, n not really. And I think unfortunately the nutrition conversation really gets clouded and and obscured by those kinds of uh, conversations and debates, is it low fat or should it be low carb? Uh, there was just a, a really good study published just a few months ago looking at uh, weight loss and looking at healthy versions of low carb versus healthy versions of low fat diet. And they showed what what we all suspected is that people lost identical weights, you know, on average for both for both uh, types of eating pattern. So no, I, I think much more depends rather than on looking at macronutrient distribution, much more depends on the quality of those macronutrients because, uh, you know, a muffin is a carb. And so, uh, you know, apples are, are uh, heavily uh, loaded with carbs too, but the type of carbs and the healthfulness of the foods, you know, couldn't be any more different. <laughs> and the same for fats. I wish muffins were healthy. I know, I know, me too. You think like, you know, a hot dog or, or you know, an avocado, you know, they both have, uh, they both have fat. They couldn't be any, any more different. Um, so, you know, and even, you know, perhaps even in the saturated fat family, there probably is a gradation in risk associated with foods, different foods with saturated fat. So, so it's, it's more than the macronutrient. And, and in addition to that, uh, other than extreme, um, extreme carbohydrate restrictions or extreme um, fat restrictions, you know, most people are not really monitoring or aware of, um, of the macronutrient distribution and would find it nearly impossible to track that. So that, that's another, another item of, um, 
of dietary prescriptions that I think is, is very, um, very difficult for people to, first of all, it's unnecessary, but also it's conveyed in a sense that's very difficult to, to uh, appreciate. I mean, who knows what the fat distribution is in their diet? Mm. And I would say the same thing goes for sodium. You know, one of the other hallmarks of a healthy diet is, is, um, you know, keeping uh, sodium levels, uh, you know, reasonably low. And you know, the it's interesting. There's so many debates, uh, as I'm sure you're you're very well aware of, between the 1500 milligram per day sodium versus 2300 milligrams. And do we really need to go low? And are there dangers in some people, perhaps, for going lower? But you know, the fact is, again, you know, for popula- population health. Uh, you know, uh, statistics, you know, the 1500 versus 2300 might be very useful. But when it comes down to an individual patient, you know, I've, I've spoken to large groups of nutrition specialists and asked them to raise their hand. How many people can, can estimate with, uh, with very uh, clear idea about what their daily intake of sodium was yesterday? And, you know, no hands go up. So, you know, when we say, you know, we, we think a 1500 milligram sodium diet is better than a 2300 milligram. Well, how are people supposed to figure that out in the first place? Right. So instead of advice like that, I tend to um, talk about uh, foods that are that are high in sodium. And it, it actually might surprise you. Um, uh, interesting, any guess is to, in the U.S., the, the food source that is um, the most responsible for sodium intake? It, it's not intuitive. Any, any guess? I think this is a sli- slightly educated guess. I would say bread. Yes, it's a very educated uh, guess. It's bread. Bread is right, and most people though that's 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 a, a great uh, great choice. But most people wouldn't uh, assume that because you know when you eat bread, it's not particularly salty. But there is actually a a good amount of uh, a salt, even though it doesn't taste salty in each uh, slice. And the fact is, Americans on average eat a whole lot of bread. And so uh, bread then becomes the number one food source. Number two are uh, cold cuts, processed meat. And number three is pizza. So, you know, what I talk to people about is, is you know, looking at those foods and suggesting, you know, healthier alternatives. Again, not just say, you know, don't eat, you know, so much bread or cold cuts or uh, pizza, but, you know, talk about what some healthy substitutes are and, and to look for foods uh, that, are, that, are, that are better substitutes. So those, you know, in addition to soups and pretzels or salty snacks and so forth. But, but again, you know, rather than focusing on a number, you know, for patients, it's much more, I think, impactful to look at the foods that are the biggest culprits and to look at replacing them with healthier options. I, I think because we're coming to the end of the time, I was going to give uh, Paul and Molly, why don't you guys each ask one of the questions, either from your own question or, or a question from social media, and then we'll have to let Steve go. But I think it's pretty clear that we're going to need to do more nutrition episodes with the interest from the audience and with how many questions we still have to get to that we won't be able to get to tonight. Absolutely. Yeah. One that came up a lot on social media and also I hear a lot of patients asking about is the intermittent fasting diets and how you feel about those. Well, you know, there's a lot of data, really fascinating. Short answer is that it does look like there um, is a signal of benefit in terms of weight loss and even in animal studies, in particular longevity, whether those longevity benefits are going to translate into uh, patients, we don't know. But um, also, you know, there's um, the, the theoretically possible and then the realistically possible. And I think that most people would find it very difficult to have very extreme forms of uh, fasting diets, but there's a million variations. And, and one that might take hold is trying to contract the eating period into a, a smaller chunk of the day. And, uh, and that, you know, to shave maybe eating breakfast an hour or two later and dinner an hour or two earlier than you might normally do. And there might be benefits for, for weight loss and uh, uh, some disease management with those sorts of uh, uh, approaches. So we don't know, but it's really intriguing initial data. Paul? No, I think I want to save anything I have for part two, because I feel like we don't have time to get to ketogenic and Atkins diets this time around. So I, I, I think why don't we use this as an excuse to do some more of this stuff. Okay. So, Steve, I wanted to ask, uh, actually, I wanted to ask if you have any plugs that you'd like to give uh, for your for your nonprofit or anything else, any other resources you think might be useful to the audience as they start to learn more about nutrition. 
Well, uh, thanks. You know, in my own career, I've actually uh, left my full-time practice to become director of this educational nonprofit, the Gaples Institute for Integrative Cardiology, and it's focused completely on education and advocacy for making nutrition and lifestyle a bigger part of healthcare. Um, I've just found in my work as a cardiologist, I've seen too many patients and too many people whose disease could have been avoided by more attention to this. And as we mentioned earlier in the show, there just is so little education in this area. So one of our big initiatives is a uh, continuing medical education program uh, about clinical nutrition essentials. It's three hours and self-paced. Um, we, we've uh, taken a year to put this together. And I think it provides at least the foundation of nutrition that can be impactful for clinicians. So if people are interested in checking that out, you can uh, go to our nonprofit. It's uh, Gaples, G-A-P-L-E-S, institute.org, and check that out. Uh, There's also information for the public. We're about in two weeks to launch a whole super expanded um, set of information for the public, interactive, kind of a nutrition course for the public with lots of practical information, interactive, fun things. So again, that's on the same website. So I I really encourage uh, people to check that out. We don't sell anything, our nutrition course we we charge for, but there's nothing else that, that is on our site for sale. We are really just trying to educate and advocate for uh, a difference in the way healthcare is given to put more attention to nutrition and lifestyle. So that uh, that's it. It's uh, It's been great to be on, on the show. Thanks so much for such great questions. Thanks so much for coming in. Uh, it was great having you. Thank you so much for doing the show. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Tonight, it was actually all about food, Paul. That's uh, quite quite fitting for, for once. <laughs> um, <laughs> get, was that an attempt at a pun? <laughs> you, could, you could get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and get on our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food. And we're committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. You can send an email to thecurbsiders at gmail.com or reach out on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at The Curbsiders. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I'm Dr. Molly Hoyblein. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, and goodbye. And thank you to all of our curbsiders who helped to write and produce the show. Uh, where Stuart was not with us tonight, and a shout out to him. And uh, thank Why are we doing that? <laughs> and thank you to our social media team. Hannah R. Abrams runs our Twitter. Beth Garbs Garbatelli is on Instagram. And Chris the Chew Man Chew is on Facebook. Thank you and good night. Good night. getting a lot of feedback over here because my cat keeps hopping up on no. trying to eat my microphone and <laughs> no this podcast is no stranger to cats and it's, <laughs> yes uh... <laughs> i know i wish i could see paul and uh and i was looking forward to seeing Stuart because i keep hearing how distracting he is but... oh gosh uh <laughs> it's we're taking a little holiday from each other right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're spending some time apart need a break <laughs>